So let's begin with the presentation. <clears throat> Uh, this presentation is intended to give a brief overview of the recent proposal that was issued by the European Commission for a regulation on imports to and exports from the EU in relation to deforestation free commodities. Today I'm going to uh, run through some of the key points of the regulation. Uh, of course, we cannot cover everything in a 30 minute uh, slot. It's quite a comprehensive regulation, so more time would be needed but we will try to cover the main topics for sure. An important point as a proposal only for a new regulation, we need to say that from the outset, some elements of the regulation may change even considerably between now and when it's finally approved. The proposal was published in November, 2021. Uh, within the proposal text itself, the EU describes that it has been concerned uh, that deforestation and, and forest degradation are occurring at an alarming rate, aggravating climate change and the loss of biodiversity. The main driver of deforestation and forest degradation is the, ex uh, the expansion of agricultural land to produce commodities such as cattle, uh, wood, palm oil and soy. The proposal again describes how the EU as an important consumer region of such commodities uh, can reduce its contribution uh, to deforestation. So the stated objectives uh, within the regulation itself are to minimize consumption of products coming from supply chains associated with deforestation or forest degradation and to increase demand in legal and deforestation free commodities and products. We don't know yet when the regulation will come into force, but the proposal does need to be approved by both the European Commission and the European Parliament before that happens. So this will take some time, a year, maybe up to two years. That seems uh, like it's a long way off. Uh, as it's written now, uh, businesses will have to comply with all requirements of the regulation from 12 months from the date of entry into force of the regulation. So for those familiar with the EU timber regulation, companies had three years to prepare uh, uh, after that regulation came into force. So the time frame for uh, preparation is significantly reduced as the proposal is written now. For this reason, the Life Legal Wood project felt that it was important to provide information on the proposal as early as possible, really to give companies and stakeholders an idea as to what's coming. So I just mentioned the EU timber regulation. Uh, it's probably an important point for many uh, listeners on this webinar. Uh, the, uh, the proposed regulation will actually uh, replace the EU timber regulation. There are many similarities in re relation to the uh, due diligence functions and the obligations on businesses between the existing EU timber regulation and the proposed EU deforestation regulation. But there are some uh, significant and important differences as well. And in this presentation, we'll try to highlight those main differences. So just a quick uh, summary uh, of the key components, of the key elements of the regulatory proposal. These include a prohibition to place on the EU market or export from the EU certain commodities which are not deforestation free or have not been produced in accordance with the relevant legislation of the country of production. Secondly, the proposal includes a requirement for businesses placing these products on the EU market or exporting them to exercise due diligence to ensure that the risks of deforestation occur in within, the, within their supply chains or the risks of illegal production or trade is low. The regulation uh, places a series of obligations on member states to ensure enforcement and implementation of the regulation. And finally, there's the establishment of what the proposed uh, legislation, the proposed regulation calls an information system, 
which is also a new development compared to the EU timber regulation, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. But in general, this presentation will focus on points one and two. <clears throat> so a key difference to the EU timber regulation is obviously the product scope. In the new proposed regulation, uh, the following commodities that you can see on your screens are included. Wood, beef, palm oil, soy, coffee, and cocoa, and also some derived products from these commodities, for example, leather from cows, chocolate from cocoa. These are considered by the EU to have the highest importance and impact uh, related to deforestation and forest degradation. More specifically, the, the, the proposal defines which commodities or products are included within the regulation according to EU customs codes. Uh, you'll find those in Annex 1 of the proposed regulation. This means that any product or commodity imported or exported under a different customs code would be considered to be exempt effectively from the, from the regulation. So uh, just to go through each commodity individually, uh, in, case of, in the case of wood products, the scope of products is really exactly the same as Annex 1 of the EU timber regulation. That basically means most products containing paper, cardboard, wood chips or fiber or solid wood are included within the regulation, excluding printed materials. The EU has not revised the scope of products to reflect concerns which have been expressed by civil society organizations or uh, previous consultations on this matter. In the case of beef, the products, uh, the scope of products includes live cattle, meat, offal, and hides of various descriptions. For cocoa, it considers cocoa beans, cocoa paste, uh, cocoa butters and oils, cocoa powder and chocolate as a derivative. <clears throat> In the case of coffee, uh, coffee is coffee, coffee beans, husks and uh, substitutes containing coffee. For soy, soybeans, flour, meal, soy oil and other reg residues. And in the case of oil palm, uh, palm oil and its uh, different stages of refining, uh, palm nuts and kernels, as well as babasu oil. So <clears throat> let's look at who the main actors are in relation to the proposed regulation. There are four of them, the EU Commission, member states, customs authorities, and businesses. Uh, let's talk a little bit about each of those. The European Commission, uh, that's obviously the executive branch of the EU, proposes legislation, implements decisions and upholds EU treaties, and really manages just the day-to-day -day business of the EU. In terms of obligations uh, with regards to this proposed regulation, uh, the role of the European Commission is to define the regulation and subsequent implementing regulations which have still to be developed or drafted and to provide guidance to ensure that member states are implementing their obligations uh, to coordinate information sharing between member states. Uh, and the commission is also responsible for developing the, that information system and interface with the customs database. Member states also have an important role to play. Uh, one or more competent authority uh, must be designated by each member state. These are responsible to uh, uh, oversee the enforcement of the regulation. Uh, member states also developed, will develop rules on penalties within their jurisdiction and carry out checks on operators. And in a new development compared to the EU timber regulation, customs authorities of the EU member states will have a much larger role in supporting the enforcement and implementation of the regulation. So they are basically responsible for controlling the correct declaration of relevant commodities and products entering to or leaving the, uh, the EU market. 
Then obviously we have businesses or private sector organizations of which there are kind of three broad types, which we'll discuss in turn now, uh, operators, traders, and authorized representatives. So starting with uh, operators, an operator is an organization that places commodities or products for the first time on the EU market. So the, uh, the operator would be responsible for customs clearing uh, a product as it's imported into the EU market. Or an operator may be an organization that exports those commodities or products from the EU market. EU operators are subject to the main requirements of the regulation and must exercise due diligence on these products. That's an important addition. Excuse me, there's some noise behind me. That's an important addition here uh, to mention that export is included within this regulation. So the regulation will not just be applicable to importers, but also to uh, the export of products from the EU market as well. All operators must ensure also that their products are covered by a due diligence statement, which accompanies their application for import or export uh, of products uh, or commodities within the scope of the regulation. Another development uh, for this regulation are authorized representatives. So if you're familiar with the EU timber regulation, the concept of a monitoring organization has been removed Instead, uh, the, the text describes that operators can give mandate to an authorized representative. There's no full description of what uh, type of organization an authorized representative would be. However, uh, it appears that an authorized representative would, would provide a support function effectively to operators. They could conduct due diligence and specifically submit due diligence statements on the behalf of the operator. Importantly, however, the operator will always retain responsibility and liability for compliance with the regulation. And finally, traders. Traders are defined really very similarly to as they are in the EU timber regulation. They are those businesses which buy or sell products effectively already on the EU market. Uh, they are required to keep information about their suppliers and customers to make traceability of products subject to the regulation easier. Uh, so they must be able to identify all of their buyers and suppliers, keep information for five years, and provide that information to competent authorities on request. There is one important change in the language of the regulation, such that traders which are not small or medium enterprises will be required to meet the same due diligence obligations as an operator. That's just ex this is extremely important for larger companies. They will be required to actively have in place a due diligence system and conduct the full level of due diligence on their, on their supply chains. The size of an SME and the, the description of an SME can be found in, this, in the directive at the bottom of the screen. Uh, however, uh, it's approximately there are uh, SMEs stop, companies stop being SMEs when they have a net turnover of 40 million euros or, or larger and an average number of, of uh, employees at, at a larger, larger than 250. So let's focus on the obligations now for operators for whom the bulk of responsibilities lie. <clears throat> operators may only place on the market uh, or export products that are deforestation free and have been produced in accordance with the relevant legislation of the country of production. So this is a key change, again, for those familiar with the EU timber regulation, deforestation free has been added on top of legality. It's not just important that uh, production and trade is legal. Uh, it's also important whether or not the production of that commodity has contributed to deforestation, forest degradation. 
The operator must have in place a due diligence system to avoid in its sourcing commodities or products which are associated with uh, risks of illegal production or deforestation. And finally, all products placed on the market or exported must be covered by a due diligence statement which accompanies uh, that import or export. So let's look at some definitions. Uh, there are some very important definitions, definitions in the regulation which will have wide ranging implication for operators. Article three of the proposal requires that all products have to be deforestation free, but how is that defined? For all commodities, the regulation refers to uh, they're being produced on land which has not been subject to deforestation after December the 31st, 2020. This date effectively becomes a cutoff date, if you like, for deforestation in the proposal. Additionally, the, the definition of deforestation free includes in the case of wood products that the wood has been harvested without having caused forest degradation after December the 31st, 2020 also. So that definition of deforestation free differs slightly between agricultural commodities and then uh, wood and timber products. And interestingly, when we look at the definition of, defo of forest degradation in the proposal, it appears to describe this in the context of harvesting operations which are not sustainable. It then goes on to define what sustainable harvesting operations are. So this is text from the regulation itself, the proposed regulation. Uh, this means that there are some, again, some clear definitions or differences in the way that the regulation treats timber products and other agricultural commodities. Uh, and it's quite important to uh, just to understand that difference. Whether these definitions survive or not, between now and when the uh, regulation is uh, finalized uh, and approved, we'll, we'll see. Also on legality, there are some, some changes compared to the EU timber, re timber regulation in terms of how it's defined. Uh, legality is defined as compliance with relevant legislation in the country of production in terms of land use rights, environmental protection, third parties' rights, and relevant trade and customs regulations. They, the text has taken away, or this proposal takes away the mention of taxes and fees. That's not included. And that appears to be a significant omission, if you like, from, this, uh, from the commission. Third parties' rights are included. That would include indigenous people's rights, but there's no direct reference to labor or other types of rights. Also important to mention is the fact that within the regulation as a whole, the proposed regulation, there's no reference to products with CITES certificates being exempt, which is a, a change from the EU timber regulation. Uh, there is, however, a reference to recycled materials, presumably relevant to wood products mostly, uh, as being exempt from the requirements of this regulation. So just to summarize, there is a slight difference between agricultural commodities and wood. All, all products and commodities included within the scope must be produced in compliance with relevant legislation and uh, must have been produced on land that was not deforested after the 31st of December, 2020. Additionally, wood products uh, must comply with the legality, uh, uh, the relevant legislation, uh, and also without having contrib contributed to forest degradation after the 31st of December 2020. So let's uh, hone in on some of those due diligence obligations of operators. So broadly, the due diligence requirements are very similar in nature to those described in the EU timber regulation, if you're familiar with that. Uh, but we'll look at those a little bit now uh, anyway. Uh, there is uh, one significant change, which is how operators report their due diligence to authorities. 
So before placing a product uh, on the EU market or exporting it, uh, operators must submit a due diligence statement through an online information system. This has to happen again uh, before placing it on the market or before exporting the product. The due diligence statement basically provides an, an assurance from the operator that the product is negligible risk or, or low risk in relation to legal non-compliance and being deforestation free. So this puts pressure on the operator to have their due diligence done before they actually seek approval for import or export. Uh, information to be contained within that due diligence statement is included within Annex 2 of the draft regulation. Uh, it includes the operator's name and address, the customs codes and quantities of the relevant commodity or product, the country of production, and all plots of land of production, including geolocalization coordinates. And we'll talk a little bit about a little bit a little more about that later. Uh, the due diligence statement must also include a statement confirming that due diligence has been conducted in, in accordance with the regulation and that no or only negligible risk has been concluded. So this slide is a little bit busy. I apologize for that. It's an illustration of our understanding how the information system will be put into place drawn from the text of the proposed regulation. Firstly, the European Commission uh, proposes that the information system, which you can see in the middle of the, the slide, uh, will provide a series of functionalities, the registration of operators, the ability to upload and link to due diligence statements associated with customers' declarations, the ability for authorities to record the outcome of controls, on those due diligence statements, uh, the ability for risk profiling of operators and relevant commodities or products for the purpose of identifying high risk consignments. So those are the intended functionalities. Again, if you look at the, uh, the graphic, you can see the operators on the left hand, the lower left hand side of the slide, uh, they will have to submit a due diligence statement with their customs declarations to the information system, which has an, an interface linking with the EU single window environment for customs. When the operator applies for customs clearance, uh, customs agents can verify this application through the interface and link it with the due diligence statement that the operator has also submitted. So we're just focusing on the operator here. Uh, there's a whole load of things happening. You can see on the slide on the right-hand side in terms of how the customs authorities, other competent authorities, and the European Commission will interact with the information system. Uh, we don't have time to cover those here, but I would just like to summarize uh, what's clear from this information system. Firstly, that there will be an online system where customs authorities can check due diligence information and secondly, that competent authorities for each member state in their checks and inspections of operators will use it to identify either which products an operator has imported or exported, or that the due diligence statements provided in their applications for customs clearance provide accurate and correct information. The due diligence requirements of Article 8 uh, of the regulation are formulated very similarly to the UTR. So there is some collection of information required. Note that the text doesn't just refer to having access to information, it talks about collection. In other words, the operator must actually collect and presumably maintain the information it has obtained on its supply chains on file. The operator must also conduct a risk assessment where uh, based on that information which has been collected, where risk is concluded as being neg negligible or low risk or, or not low risk, and where risk is concluded as not being low, then the operator is required to conduct risk mitigation prior to uh, importing or exporting those commodities or products. In relation to the collection of information, operators uh, need to collect information, documents, or other data 
demonstrating that the relevant commodities or products are deforestation free and have been produced in accordance with the relevant legislation of the country of production. This includes different types of information. You're familiar to some of these uh, working with the EU timber regulation, perhaps uh, basic information about the commodity or the product itself. However, uh, in, in addition, uh, verifiable information that indicates or demonstrates uh, that the relevant products are deforestation free and, and that they're legal. What I would like to do is just highlight what's in green here. Uh, in Article 9 of the regulation, there's a very important addition. For the supply chains relevant to each product that are being imported or exported, the operator must have the geolocalization as well as the date or time range of production of that specific product. This applies to all supply chains, whether the commodity or the product is from a low risk country or not. This is something which is going to be discussed uh, a lot, I imagine, in the coming months, given the challenges that exist to obtain and, and have information, this type of information uh, uh, for companies which are uh, doing this type of due diligence already. Uh, and it definitely represents a tightening or strengthening of the, of the information requirements uh, in comparison with the EU timber regulation. So risk assessment. Uh, operators uh, are required to evaluate different types of risk, including risk, obviously, that the raw materials sourced are, are not deforestation free or that they haven't been uh, produced in accordance with the relevant legislation of the country, uh, the operator will need to evaluate also the risk of mixing. Uh, in other words, the risk that uh, commodities within their supply chain have been inadvertently or accidentally mixed with other uh, material of unknown origin or which may have a, a higher risk profile. And they should document that risk assessment. So the operators need to uh, <clears throat> uh, demonstrate how the risk conclusions uh, were made and which risk mitigation measures were taken, among other things. <clears throat> the risk assessment process uh, for, is similar to that in the EU timber regulation in that the regulation provides some specific points that the risk assessment shall take into consideration. I'm not going to talk to all of these points that you can see on the screen. Uh, however, these will include obviously the, pres the presence of forests in that country, the presence of production of the relevant commodity or product, uh, the prevalence of deforestation and forest degradation, uh, other concerns in relation to the country of production, uh, the level of corruption, the prevalence of uh, document and data falsification, uh, the levels of law enforcement, things like this. The complexity of the supply chain and the potential for risk of mixing uh, of the commodities. However, with regards to the first point, uh, the assignment of risk to the relevant country by the European Commission, I just want to highlight Article 27 and what this means. So this is a new development. Uh, it appears that the European Commission will uh, provide a central database of risk assessments. Uh, that means that the Commission will actually uh, publish a, a three-tier list of low standard and high risk countries. And uh, that's based on additional delegated regulations which are not developed yet. Uh, the proposed regulation provides a separate series of points that the Commission will take into account though to evaluate risks. And it makes mention that uh, it will consult with the countries concerned as well. So why would the European Commission do this? The objectives appear to be twofold. Firstly, to provide a high level kind of alignment at the country level for operator risk assessments, uh, to provide some clarity as to which countries of origin are broadly low standard or, or high risk. The risk assessments will also be published on that information system. So competent authorities can use them to evaluate the due diligence statements of the operator. So 
One final point related to these risk assessments by the Commission. Uh, if operators are sourcing from countries that the Commission has designated as low risk, operators will be allowed to conduct a simplified due diligence. That basically means that the first step of due diligence will be required, the collecting of information, uh, demonstrating that the commodities and products are deforestation free and legally produced, but they are dispensed from carrying out the second and the third steps of due diligence. In other words, there is no need to conduct uh, risk assessment or risk mitigation activities. In other words, yeah. And the final step in the due diligence process, which the regulation speaks to is risk mitigation. So operators must have in place controls and procedures to mitigate and manage risks. And uh, it's required to the operators shall adopt, shall implement risk mitigation measures where risks have been identified in that previous step in the risk assessment. That risk mitigation must take place prior to importing or exporting that product or commodity. I won't speak much about this now, but just a note on certification schemes as a risk mitigation measure. Christian, I think we'll talk more uh, on this in the next presentation. Similarly, similarly to the EU timber regulation, certification or other third party verified schemes uh, can be used in risk mitigation or risk assessment or mitigation. However, uh, they should not substitute the operator's responsibilities. In other words, the operator cannot just automatically assume that without any further work, products are low risk just because they're certified. And for those uh, companies uh, working with Flegty licensed wood products, uh, Flegty licensed uh, products accompanied with a valid Flegty license uh, will be compliance with Article 3B of the regulation, which is the legality requirement. A Flegty license uh, will not meet the deforestation free requirement of the regulation. And finally, very quickly, uh, operators. Uh, or what we, I should say what we see with regards to the regulation is that the quality management aspects of the due diligence uh, system, uh, the requirements for, the, for quality management are strengthened in this regulation in comparison with the EU timber regulation. Operators uh, still need to establish and maintain a due diligence system. This must be documented. It must be, the due diligence system must be reviewed at least once a year. And also on an annual basis, operators must publicly report on their due diligence system, including the steps they have taken to meet the regulation. So that's definitely a, a new requirement. I'm going to finish now with just a few comments on controls and checks. I'm a little bit over time. Very briefly, uh, it's uh, the competent authorities that are responsible for the implementation and the conducting of checks on operators. They will use the information system to carry, it, to carry out a risk-based approach to selecting who or what is going to be evaluated. Annual checks uh, are described in the regulation as, as uh, covering at least 5% of operators and 5% of the quantity of each of the relevant commodities, but there is scope for increasing those percentages for origins uh, for high-risk countries as well as high-risk commodities, basically. And in relation to penalties, member states are also responsible for setting the penalties, as we mentioned. Uh, the penalties uh, provided or uh, uh, implemented need to be effective, proportionate to the size of the infractions and generally dissuasive in nature, such that they would determine, deter, I should say, sorry, non-compliance uh, with the regulation. Uh, and in fact, the regulation does uh, provide more detail uh, than I'm including here. It provides some specific uh, requirements in terms of the nature and the size of those penalties. And those penalties may include fines, confiscation of products, confiscation of revenues gained by the operator uh, in trading those commodities or exclusion from public procurement processes.
And final slide, competent authorities uh, 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 also have uh, the ability to take corrective actions. Again, this is a, an addition in comparison to the EU timber regulation. Competent authorities can require uh, different measures to address non and rectify non-compliances. Uh, this may include just rectification of the non-compliance in any particular way, uh, stopping the product, preventing it from uh, being placed on the EU market or exported, withdrawing or recalling a non-compliant uh, commodity or product, or destroying that product uh, or donating it to charitable or public interest purposes. And I will stop there. Thank you.